I'll read again from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the passage that is serving as our guiding text throughout this series of studies, studies that are designed to show us the importance of the Word of God, how to rightly divide that Word of God, which we must when we study correctly, 2 Timothy 2.15, and how we can understand just how the Word of God got on this earth and the importance of it to us in learning how to be saved from our sins and live the Christian life. Paul, in writing the church at Corinth, said, verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5, beginning, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. I have tried to prepare these lessons where each one would stand alone, yet each following lesson would build on the last one and thus help us better understand the unfolding of just how God would save us and to emphasize without the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 verse 11, being preached, there can be no understanding of how it is that men who are estranged from God by their sins against Him, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, may be reconciled to him. So, the word of reconciliation. Now, in order to understand fully the work of the ambassadors, uh, any ambassador, whether it's uh, humanly or divinely sent, then it's essential that we find the time, where, and place, and the when. The time, the when, and place where they entered upon their particular duties. Now the feast of Pentecost that we see in Acts chapter 2, and it's designated in the Old Testament as the Feast of Weeks, was one of three great feast days, annual feasts of the Jews. And according to the law of Moses, all males among the Jews were required to be at Jerusalem at each one of these feasts. <clears throat> now the day of Pentecost came 50 days after the Passover feast. And you'll remember that Jesus was crucified at the feast of the Passover. So 50 days after this, being the first Pentecost after His crucifixion, in the city of Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, was poured out upon the apostles who were chosen by Christ himself to be his ambassadors from the court of heaven to men upon earth. Thus, in that transpiring, there was fulfilled the promise of Jesus Christ himself that they, the apostles, or the ambassadors of Christ, should be endued with power from on high as found in the preceding chapter, Acts chapter 1. Now, of course, this was indeed a very notable day. And I think we all would agree that it would be very hard to overestimate the importance of its events to a world lost in sin. Everything preceding Acts chapter 2 pointed to the events of Acts 2 and the establishment of the church of our Lord. Everything following Acts 2 in reference to the church speaks of it as a reality. Thus, we can very well, if some have called Acts 2, refer to it correctly as the hub of the Bible. We need to understand that when you look at things being put together, involving many loose threads, it's amazing how it is that God was able to, and it's all because He is God and all that that implies. That He can make everything come down to that particular day at that time in Jerusalem in that place. The antecedent ages, the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, were all preparatory to what transpires in Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost feast day following the resurrection of Christ. 
for around 4,000 years through the father rule period, the patriarchal age, and the Jewish dispensation, through patriarchs, through the children of Israel, we know later as Jews, through all manner of prophets and priests, through kings, through altars and sacrifices, through types and shadows, God had been preparing the world for the work that is inaugurated on that first Pentecost in Jerusalem following the resurrection of Christ. Two great problems. The insufficiency of the law of Moses to redeem man and man's inability of himself alone to redeem himself had been solved on the events of that day. The former by the Jewish nation, the latter by the Gentile, all non-Jews in their world. All of these are now having access through the gospel, the word of reconciliation to God. You remember as you study the Old Testament that the Jews, because of their rebellion against God through the law of Moses, had lost their nationality and had been depressed and dispersed and ground down among all the nations as punishment for their lack of faithfulness, their disobedience. Though rebellious and wicked, they had continued to hold to the truth of one God. And through this dispersion, following the Babylonian captivity, they carried to the heathen nations, the Gentile world, a knowledge of the one, the true, and the living God. They kept God's name alive among the nations through all these years. And as time went on, these heathen nations, weary and worn because of their failure to find the basis of hope in mere human wisdom and various human philosophies, were then in a condition to receive the message of the gospel, of salvation, of hope, and of peace in the gospel. I pause here to emphasize that if you ever do any study of history of religious things of that time, it is rather amazing to see the dissatisfaction and the despondency in the Gentile world regarding the religions that they had. And how through the buildup of the Jews of the Messianic prophecies that they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. It's highly unlikely that we realize that today. And certainly it's not experienced in our day when we seem to be going right the opposite direction. But it was so in that day and time. The Jews were tired of oppression. It's true they didn't understand the specifics and details of the reason for their being a nation and the design and purpose of the law of Moses. They didn't understand the Old Testament prophecies specifically about the nature of the Messiah and His kingdom. But they understood there was a Messiah. They understood there was a deliverer. They understood there is one true and living God. And they knew God would keep His promises. Thus, at this time, they were very anxiously awaiting the promised one they thought would release them from the burdens of life. And all of that had been fed because there had come one, John the Baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ, declaring, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Devout men on this day of Pentecost, out of every nation, in a spirit of obedience to the law of Moses, had journeyed in keeping the law to that great city that they might keep those feasts. On this day, the day of Pentecost, as Luke records by inspiration in Acts 2, the Jews by the thousands were in that city doing as the law required of them. You might say the cream of the crops there as far as Judaism is concerned because it was no light matter for the men three times a year to travel from wherever they had been dispersed all over the Roman Empire and farther to the east to keep the law by being there. It took a great amount of uh, pre preparation. In obedience to the command of Jesus, you'll remember, his, his apostles, his ambassadors, had returned from the Mount of Ascension down to the, up to the city of Jerusalem. And there they were to await, as Christ had said, the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. And they were all together there doing as the Lord told them to do. The scripture says, with one accord in one place. 
A few days before this, Jesus had, having finished his work on earth, had ascended to the throne of God. And there in the presence of the host of heaven and all the glory that there would be there beyond the mortal mind to grasp, amidst archangels and angels and his Father and the Holy Spirit, the hierarchies of heaven had placed upon the head of Jesus Christ that head that not long before had worn a crown of thorns, the great diadem of having all authority in heaven and on earth, the crown of universal dominion, and in his nail-pierced hands there was then, in a glorified resurrected body, the scepter of universal authority. And on this day, this day of Pentecost, in fulfillment of the promise that he, Christ, had made of another comforter, one to work with the apostles only invisibly, even as he had worked with them and had been with them and associated with them. He sent then the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who coming upon the apostles indicated his presence by the sound of a rushing mighty wind coming down from heaven, but there's no wind. And then setting upon each one of the apostles were cloven tongues like as a fire. And further proof was that they spake in languages they'd never studied to the whole crowd that was gathered there out of every nation under heaven. Luke records all of this in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Never, never in the world's history was there such a combination of events as there was upon that day. Joel, the Old Testament prophet of God, some 800 years prior to this time, had prophesied that there should be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that there should be a deliverance in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, Joel 2 and verse 32. The great messianic prophet Isaiah, some 750 years or so before, had prophesied of this great and notable day. He wrote, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Now about seven days before this day, our Lord had said to his apostles, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke 24, 46 to 49. But our Lord had also said, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. You see, they were being taken care of that they could be the ambassadors from the court of heaven to the earth and to man. He says unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1, 5 through 8. It's highly important to note that the early church in carrying the gospel to the world followed that very plan. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth in the proclamation of the gospel, God's power to save. The word of reconciliation. Now it being the right time, Acts 2.17, the last days, the apostles being in the right place, Jerusalem, Acts 1 and verse number 12. 
They being in the right condition, endued with power from on high, which the Holy Spirit had bestowed upon them, Luke 24, 49. And the right people being present. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language, Acts 2, 5, and 6. Well, this certainly was, to say the least, an auspicious time for the beginning of a divine embassy that will not end until, to use the terms of John in the book of Revelation, the angel stands with one foot upon the earth and the other up on the sea and declares that time shall be no longer. It was on this day and at this time, at this place, that the ministry of reconciliation began under the divine guidance from the Holy Spirit through the ambassadors of the court of heaven. The Holy Spirit came down and, if you please, took his abode with the people made ready through the ministry of John the baptizer and Jesus himself, and in the limited commission of the disciples of Christ to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the church of our Lord stood forth a living organism prepared for its work in the salvation of man. When you read through Acts 2, it's very obvious then that the church has a place, a highly significant place in the salvation of man for all the saved. Those saved by Jesus Christ, who heard the word of reconciliation, who believed it, who repented of their sins, were baptized in the name of Christ, were added to that institution, the church by Jesus Christ himself, which church is his spiritual body. Now we'll have a little more to say, the Lord willing, and maybe a fuller investigation of the work of ambassadors on this day later on. But... As to now is concerned, as remission of sins was preached on this day, it was to be preached among all nations. Luke 24, 46 through 47. The term, all nations, here and in the other records, give us a deeper understanding of what is meant when it says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't it amazing how a God who never did anything but good for man, and yet man overall has always spited Him, and worked against Him, not appreciated Him, not loved Him, and rebelled against Him, not kept His law, that he would still continue down through all these thousands of years to make a way, beginning at one particular time, for rebellious mankind to be saved. The term all nations then is an important thing to us to know in the church because we are charged with carrying the gospel to every creature. According to your several ability, you have as personally the responsibility to do all you can to teach other people this word, whereby men are reconciled to God, and the very word that reconciled you to God when you believed it and obeyed it and were baptized into Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We were saved to save others. It is by the church that the Great Commission is carried into the world. And it's rather amazing when we see the infinite wisdom of Almighty God in putting all these things down with all these different people and their backgrounds and all those things to get done what He did on the day of Pentecost. And yet we sometimes don't think that we have the wherewithal to reach somebody with the saving power of God with this same word. Everybody that is accountable to God for his actions has sinned against God, Romans 3.23, and separated from God. All of us who have heard humbly the truth of the gospel 
believed it and submitted to the mandates of Prince Emmanuel presented therein and have obeyed it in being baptized to Christ have a tremendous privilege but a great obligation that we are to bear the burden of the cross of Christ in preaching this gospel to every creature. Now the wisdom of God I just mentioned, isn't it amazing that he left it in our hands? Did you notice the song a moment ago? That used to be the theme song that we used many years ago in the program that we had into our hands. The gospel is given. God will not be able to do all he wants to do as great and powerful he is. And it goes beyond my mind to think of how powerful he is. Except that the church preached the gospel to every creature. That's the commission of our Lord who died and shed his blood to purchase the church. Into our hands the gospel is given. So we must, if you please, step up and say, I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to live like this New Testament teaches. I have a responsibility to teach this truth to everybody that I possibly can teach it to. By first of all, living it out in the way I conduct my life, being exemplary, and thus influencing people in that way. But more than that, learning it well enough so that I can instruct people in it. It's a sad thing when people live years in the church and they have never developed the ability to teach people the precious gospel of Christ. Somebody loved David Brown enough to take the time to study the scriptures so they could teach me the truth. Do I not owe that to somebody else? So repentance and remission of sins was preached first there in Jerusalem so long ago. And because God has preserved His Word, we can preach the same word of reconciliation to people today. And since it is the seed of the kingdom, and following the truth that all seeds produce after their kind, when we preach the pure, unadulterated Word of God, right and divided, men believe it, from the heart obey it. The Lord will add them to the same church that he started back there so long ago. The terms of entrance are simple. One must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But it does not stop there. And remember, that belief is the kind of belief formed upon evidence. It's not some sort of leap out there upon nothing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sets out the evidence. Adequate it is to prove that he is the Son of the living God. And upon that belief, one is commanded to repent of one's sins, Acts 17, 30, Acts 2, verse 38. Having done that, one is to confess one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Now one, having done all those, is qualified to be obedient completely to Christ and being baptized for the remission of one's sins. By the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. Listen to me. If you don't do that, you can't be saved. You can't remove a step of it, for it would remove part of the word of reconciliation. We take all of it, or we have none of it. More than that, he hasn't enjoined upon us in order to become a Christian. Less than that, and you remain dead in your sins and trespasses and without the hope of heaven. It is God's plan of salvation. It did not originate with man. It came down from heaven by the Holy Spirit on that first Pentecost, and was preached in its fullness. And you can read of it in your own Bible if you had never heard of anybody in this room because it's there as the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man, the glorious word of reconciliation. The man who preaches a different gospel imperils his own salvation. Paul declared, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now you have the mind God gave you. You have the ability to earn a living. You have the ability to study all sorts of secular things. Don't you think you can know the Word of God and honestly receive it and change your thoughts and by your will change your life in submission to it 
that you can be what this great gospel, this word of reconciliation, this seed of the kingdom can make you to be by your submission to it. But we dare not add to it, alter it in any way, or subtract from it. And it's rather obvious we can't change it. Galatians 1, 8, and 9, and expect to go to heaven. This was written to Christians. It wasn't written to people outside the church. Thus we must receive the pure, unadulterated, complete Word of God and the terms of pardon set out therein if we would be saved from our sins. And this is the way that one becomes a Christian. Not a hyphenated Christian. A Christian. And that's all. One who's of Christ. Now that's all you can find in your New Testament. Why would you want to be anything else? That's the way that's right and cannot be wrong. And that's not nearly it. That's it. Now if you need to obey the gospel this morning, if you've listened and you're honest with God and with the word of reconciliation and yourself, you know what to do to become a Christian and you know whether you have become one or you're not. You know the reason you won't do what you now know to be the truth and the way God reconciles you to Him and forgive your sins. Now why? Why would a person knowing these simple truths reject them? I don't know. All I know is, is that the word of reconciliation is what it is. And it's from heaven and not from men. And it's the way one can get to heaven. The only way one can get to heaven. And we dare not be ashamed of it. As Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, to the Greek. If you need to obey the gospel, please be honest with yourself and God. Don't resist the truth that you've heard preached. And if you think I preach something contrary to the word of reconciliation, I'd be in your debt if you would bring your Bible to me and say, Preacher, it's just not taught in the Bible like you preached it. And if you can show me that, I promise you to the best of my ability, I'll turn from anything I've taught that's error and embrace the truth as it is in all of our Bibles and live according to that truth. Now, that's the only way that one can serve God. You can't serve God by serving somebody else. You serve God by keeping His commandments. If you're a child of God and you let those things slip, then don't you need to honestly evaluate your life and be ready to repent of anything that you're doing or not doing that's contrary to the way Christians are to live? Well, surely it is. Surely it is. So repent of those sins, whatever they may be, Come confessing them and let's pray God together that he'll forgive and God's promised he would. Now there it is. How long did it take to learn it? If you were listening and honest and would receive with meekness the engrafted word, you know the way of salvation. You know in your sins how you can gain remission of your sins and stand before God sinless and reconcile to him. Why not this morning do that? For today is the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. So please respond to the truth of God's good word and the word of reconciliation while we stand and sing. <laughs>